Good morning, everyone. Certainly want to welcome you out here to this fabulous day to celebrate our veterans. Uh, very happy that the weather is accommodating to where it's nice and cool. When we do our Memorial Day, it seems like we're all sweltering in the heat. So this certainly makes it a lot more enjoyable to sit here and uh, not have that sun and the heat beating on us. I know uh, it gets pretty tough, but uh, it's a good day to be out here anyway. All right, well, at this point, uh, I would like to get things started uh, and ask that you all stand now for the presentation of colors and remain standing for the national anthem sung by Mr. Alan Payne, followed by the Pledge of Allegiance by Mr. Claude Tadaro, head of the Kenner Naval Museum Commission, and then the invocation by the Reverend Paul Clark of Divine Mercy Church. Say, can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hail at the twilight's last gleaming, whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight? O'er the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming, and the rocket's red glare, the bombs bursting in air, gave proof through the night that our flag was still there. Oh, say does that star-spangled banner yet wave o'er the land of the free and the home of the brave. We now have the pledge, a pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. God of peace, we ask for blessings on all those who have served our country in the armed forces. We ask for healing for the veterans who have been wounded in body and soul in conflicts around the globe. Bring solace to them, O oh Lord. May we pray for them when they cannot pray. We ask for an end to wars and the dawning of a new era of peace as a way to honor all the veterans of past wars. Have mercy on all our veterans. Bring peace to their hearts and peace to the regions they fought in. Bless all the soldiers who served in non-combative posts. May their calling to service continue in their lives in many positive ways. We pray for those who serve us now, especially for those in harm's way. Shield them from danger and bring them home. Turn the hearts and minds of our leaders and our enemies to the work of justice and a harvest of peace. Give us all the creative vision to see a world which, grown weary with fighting, moves to affirming the life of every human being 
and so moves beyond war. O oh God, may the peace you left us, the peace you gave us, be the peace that sustains, the peace that saves us. Amen. Y'all can be seated. Again, welcome to this very great day to be able to celebrate our veterans that are here with us today, and certainly as well as the ones who are not able to be here with us because they gave the most that they can give, and that is their service and their life. We'll also, at this point, though, want to go ahead and recognize some of our elected officials that have taken their time to come out today, starting with our uh, councilwoman at large, Maria DeFranches. Councilman District 1, Greg Carroll. <laughs> Councilman District 5, Dominic Impostata. <laughs> Justice of the Peace, Kevin Santani. <laughs> Justice of the Peace. <laughs> um, Rocco, <laughs> Rocco Lewis. Just one of those thoughts that just went away from me. Um, also is Senator Gary Smith. Uh, Mike Ganey, there he is in the back, come on up front. Uh, Keith Conley, former councilman, there he is. I can't recognize him, he slims down so much. Uh, we also have um, Rafael Sadi, who's a good member of our community. Where is he at? There he is, thank you. Also with us is a couple of groups I'd like to recognize. One group is called the Special Connection. Uh, they're here to represent their family members that have served before and uh, given their, their duty to our country. We also have veterans that are uh, over here which are from the Greenwald Center. Uh, we want to welcome them. Hello guys, ladies. And I see coming through the wings right now is the uh, District 4 Councilman Lenny Klein. Did I miss anybody? Oh, again, you're standing next to Gary, I'm sorry. Councilman Ben Zahn from the parish. Thank you, Ben. All right. As you know, Kenner has a long history of holding ceremonies to honor the military. I'm honored to continue with that tradition as the acting mayor. I'm also very proud to be part of this first ceremony here in Veterans Park with our new flagpoles honoring all five branches of the military as well as the POWs who never came home and the soldiers who remain officially classified as missing in action. That's more than 2,500 soldiers. These flagpoles would not be possible without the hard work of Mr. Arthur Tadella and the Vietnam Veterans Foundation of Kenner, as well as our Recreation Department for installing these new additions. Arthur, would you please stand? <laughs> Arthur has been a uh, very uh, constant reminder to me to uh, do something that he wanted, and that was to have these flagpoles put here so based upon his uh, urging and insistence, uh, we were able to get it done, get it funded, and get it put up in time for today. So I think it's a very well, uh, worthwhile addition to our Veterans Park. And again, thank you, Arthur. I'd like to also thank all of our active and retired military members for their valuable service to our community. Any of those active or, mi or retired military members, please stand so we can see who you are. <laughs> Certainly nice to see a big crowd of that. There are more than 1.8 million people on active duty, including militaries of our military 
assigned to one of the 737 U.S. military installations overseas. Here's hoping that all of them return home safe and sound. Now I'd like to call upon our speaker, Colonel Larry Merlington. He was an Air Force pilot who flew 54 combat missions in Iraq during the Desert Shield, Desert Storm, and was wing commander for his final year of the Air Force Reserve Wing at Belchase. He is now Chief Executive Officer of the Journey Group, an acquisition and operations firm based in New Orleans. Colonel? Good morning. Can everybody hear me okay? I don't want to. How's that? That better? It's Veterans Day, but it didn't really start out to be Veterans Day. It was Armistice Day in 1917, thereabouts, when the end of World War I, 1926, Congress said, we ought to make a national holiday out of this and call it Veterans Day. They made the holiday, but they didn't make it an official holiday until 1938. So the background is, is to honor our veterans, and as long ago as the first great war, everyone looked around and said, we need to make a special day for our veterans. And they've done it, and thank you for coming out and celebrating it today. Do me a favor, whenever you see somebody in uniform in the uh, airports, etc., walk up and thank them for their service and shake their hand. They're there to protect you. Today I want to talk about leadership in specific leadership in turbulent times. Does anyone not think this is turbulent to motion times? Okay, good. I didn't want to have to convince you that we had turbulent times going on. For decades, historians have dissected leaders of businesses, of the military, of sports teams, of churches, and even after all of that dissection, they, want, they get this, this mixed bag of how to be a great leader textbook that they sell, and because their book has the secret in it about leadership. But leadership is not new. Leadership has been with us since the dawn of time. Every generation practices some sort of leadership capabilities or non-capabilities, as the case may be. It's a word that generates a lot of different ranges of responses. If I was to ask every one of you out there today, what is leadership, I imagine I would get a cornucopia of answers that I would have to have a PhD unravel for me to make sure we got the one statement that captured everybody's. The great Chinese general Sun Tzu said, and these are I, I can't do it in China, Chinese or Mandarin, so we're going to do it in English. It's uh, that there is an individual who cultivates the moral law and strictly adheres to methods and discipline. Historian Thomas Carlyle believes that leadership is not earned or developed, it's born. People are born with it. Another side of the character there, and that debate goes on forever. Norman Schwarzkopf says that leadership is a mixture of character and strategy. And if you have to lose one, lose strategy. The underlying theme here about leadership that we start to develop is that it's got a moral fiber to it, a character fiber, that it means something to have those individuals stand for something and not just stand for performance. Much has been written about this and discussed, obviously, in places of high learning and also in every bar I've ever been in. With all the differing schools of thought, it's clear that there's no single definition that works. What works for one leader doesn't necessarily work for the ever. But nearly every academician, every historian, every leader themselves say that there's two key ingredients, maybe three core elements that you have to have. A true leader must be able to inspire. If you can't inspire, you can't lead. If you can't motivate, you cannot lead. And if you cannot have a vision about where we should go and what we should do when we get there, you cannot lead. These are core elements to leadership. In my opinion, there's four things that make up a leader. And these are after my vast experience of watching myself fail miserably at it. One, leaders have certain traits that I just called out. There's more than that, and I'll list a couple more as we go on. But these core elements are key. Two, leaders are not magically anointed at birth. I've never seen anyone come out of the womb and take charge of a company or run a, a business or do any of those things. These are developmental issues in, by somebody that wants to be a leader, that is driven to learn, that is driven for continual improvement. Three. That continual improvement, you must learn from victories, but your mistakes will teach you more. And those are the things you must move forward with. You cannot let those mista mistakes bog you down. You have to learn from them, pick yourself up, and keep moving. And four, I think leaders are situational. All of us have some sort of story I'm sure we could tell about. I didn't think old Bob was going to stand up or old Sue was going to get that done. And they did. And they did because the situation demanded it. 
In World War II, Eisenhower, after World War II, I should say, recognized this, this, this theory I have about that it, it is situational leadership when he said the following. Let me quote Ike. I have long suspected that men who possess the capacity for leadership are always among us, waiting in the wings, but it sometimes takes a great crisis to bring them to prominence. The turbulent period in which I have lived has produced its share of outstanding leaders, and it has been my great fortune to know some of them. The traits that they have, demonstrated honesty, integrity, passion in what they do, persistence and ability to overcome small setbacks, smart and insightful. I've never met a dumb good leader. I don't, I, if anybody has a case on that, see me afterwards, but they're generally not dumb. Respectful of people and their beliefs, they do not use their ego or their power in the wrong ways. They are respectful. Willing to pursue the unpopular course. The, everybody wants to go left. The lemmings are all heading to the left. They realize the lemmings are all going to jump off. They say, we can't do that. We're going right. And even to put up with the ridicule that comes with doing a hard decision that they have to carry out. And this last one is kind of a balance between ego and not. And that is that they have to be self-confident, but they need to be humble. Can you have two of those mixed together? Yes, you can. You can be self-confident, you can have an ego, but you can also be humble. You can poke fun at yourself, and you can let others poke fun at you and not get upset about it. One last ingredient that I think is key, and that is you have to have the willpower to want to lead. This is not a passive thing. This is something that's full contact. If you don't want, if you think it's just nice to have the title, that's probably wrong for you to consider yourself a leader. In this juncture, I want to make sure that I make a difference between filling the void. There are times in history and in our own lives when leaders were needed and those that stepped in did so in roles of evil and heinous purposes. Mad drunk on power <clears throat> and visions of an empire, they decimated and inflicted not hope, not courage, not strength in nations, but death, death of thousands and millions. So the distinction here is there can be poor leaders. There's no doubt about it. They can be evil leaders. There's no doubt to that. And that distinction is the corruption of power versus the character of true leaders, which is what I'm speaking of today, the character of the true leader. That distinction is clear in our country. At times we lose track of this, but we're not evil or power mad. When the United States had the opportunity in more than one occasion for world domination, what did we do? We rebuilt the countries we defeated and turned them into democracies. That is not for evil purposes. And regardless of how vilified our leadership is in this country, whether it's business, political, football coaches, doesn't matter since the evolution of the idea that birthed this concept called America, in comparison to history's despots, I would claim that America is saint-like in the way it's treated its people and done its job. This is an important point. For these are turbulent times, and it's easy to lose heart. Our leaders have, our leaders have to deal with difficult and demanding things, and those challenges we shouldn't we shouldn't make them simple. It's always easier to do the job from the cheap seats. It's never easy to do it when you're on the front line. Critics are everywhere, but there's only a certain amount of people that actually get things done. Let's start with leadership in the military. I want to talk about that just a bit because we face an asymmetric world this time. We face tribal war, guerrilla war, and areas where we have to restructure our entire forces. And as we as the world superpower react, we react sometimes with inconsistency. And in that inconsistency, we do something that, as a commander, I never want to be able to tell my team. And that is, I can't tell you what the definition of success is. I'm setting them up to fail. I'm giving them an impossible task to do. We need to go back and redefine our force structure, and we need to understand what the definition of success is in these conflicts that we're in right now. The opposite of terrorist strategy is that of nation states flexing their muscles to become more like the United States of America. Russia, China, Iran, North Korea, they seem intent on provoking us and provoking this country into some sort of situation where we need to react. We will need to continue to deal with this frontal assault on our stabilization, the stabilization of the United States. We also need to watch out the fact that their large arsenals and nuclear capability make them a formidable threat. And we cannot just passively watch what happens. We have to be actively involved. One more military thing to deal with, and that's cyber attack. Ones and zeros, not planes and airplanes, but ones and zeros can invade our world, tear open our system, shut down power grids, take control of vehicles. And countries are intent on bringing us down in an asymmetric way. 
There's some hacker right now that's 21 years old sitting in one of those countries and is having a whale of a good time trying to infect all of us with a virus right here while we sit. And that's the kind of person we need to stop. That's not part of what we determine as globalism for the planet. It is simply not one of these threats the military has to deal with. It's all of them simultaneously. It's a daunting task, requires a lot of talented people. You may recall we just completed a political election of our president. There's a lot of things to say about that, but I'm not going to go there today because I think fatigue from the election is over with, and I've got, I've got massive amounts of it, so I'm not going to mention it. But I do want to mention one thing, and I think it's one thing that's important. Donald Trump got elected as a president of the United States, and it's our jobs as Americans to honor that election and honor that seat, that title, that job. That's part of our democracy. And it's important, no matter who sits in that seat, that we give everything we can to make sure that they're successful. That doesn't mean they get a pass when they make boo-boos, but it sure as heck means that they get our support. And that's a choice. Political leadership is a choice. We have the choice. We have the, the defining vote. So it's our problem if we don't vote for the right people and at the right times, and in fact, for the right moments. We will not debate this again, I said today, because we've been there all for 20, it seems like 20 years, but I'm sure it's only been 20 months. Leadership in business right now is one of the bright spots, despite the fact that uh, we're talking about all the companies that are taking all their business offshore and, and uh, building things in different places, because why do I call it a bright spot? Business leaders set examples in adapting their businesses to changing times and technology and adapting their workforces. They are nimbler than you can expect. We still are one of the leading, we have the leading economy in the world, despite all of the problems. And so there are areas there where you can, you can say that this is good leadership is taking place in some of those locations. Two headwinds on that that are turbulence, clear and moderate, severe. One is taxation and government regulations. I think we've heard enough about that. And as I've traveled the world and done business in every one of the countries that you can imagine, I can tell you right now that our corporate taxation system and all those other elements are are the reason that we have some problems with keeping our jobs here. You can, you can gloss over that, you can make excuses and say that they need more money, but that dialogue needs to be reset between government and the businesses and get those businesses back here. Find a solution. Don't quit complaining from both sides of the cheap seat. Lastly is education and job skills. We spend a god-awful amount of money on education in this country, and yet we barely have the skills that can surpass anybody that is in a third world, and some of their, not third world, second world, that is certainly focused on getting the education systems done. Uh, we've got to find a better way to spend the money and bring the skills. I used to be a real snob about this. Everyone had to have college. Now I believe in VoTech. I believe we ought to give skills to people. They don't want to go to college. Give them some life skill that they can use, and it gives them a job here with a, with a decent earning wage. With so many complex issues, this is, we can get, you get, the idea of being committed to being American, I think, is just paramount. I lived in England for a while, and the British knew more about our government and about our election processes than I did. I was embarrassed continually when they'd sit down at dinner with me and they'd say, what do you think about Senator so-and-so? Isn't he going to vote one way or the other? I said, who is Senator? Okay? And, and they, they embarrass us. Don't ever go to London and start a political fight with anybody. They'll beat you. They'll beat you with a whip. We can't be that way. We need to be more committed to our government and an understanding what the people are going to do. Now, an axiom to this great leadership stuff is that of great leaders can't be great leaders if they don't have great followers. This is an important distinction. Not everybody can lead. You ever try to dance where everybody's leading? That doesn't work. Well, it doesn't work in our lives either. We have to be willing to give up some of that power and let people lead us. And undermining, if we undermine their vision and we undermine their abilities, we're going to let them fail, and then we too fail. We think that that's wise or funny to let them fail. It's not, because it's meaning you're going to fail in the process. Well, given the magnitude of all of this, you can, you can say that I'm going to get really worried and lethargic, and why should I do anything in this world? Look at how hard it is for me to make a difference. That paralysis can set in. But America is pretty doggone unique. The very fiber that makes American Americans is also a breeding ground, in my opinion, for making great leaders. We are largely a principled country. We believe in freedom and justice. Our police and military are volunteers, not people that are forced into doing the job. And what are they sworn to do? Protect us. That's what they're sworn to do. We have the freedom to practice our religion. These strength and character issues permeate our society. And thus, in, within this environment, our young men and women have the opportunity to watch us and see how we lead and learn from that in a test tube where it is a positive experience, not the non-positive experience of what happens with beheadings in other countries to teach leadership. 
Within our society, the Finding Fathers envision that there's an implied responsibility that links this whole idea of leadership intimately and personally to each one of us. And if there is a punchline in my talk today, this is the coming up right now. And that is this responsibility recognizes that each one of us has an impact in how this works. Each one, individually. Not them or they or any of those things, but each one of us. America is a country where democracy is an infused leadership and it's fostered and promoted and expected with what we do from the day we're born. As individual Americans that practice those traits, we make great leaders great. We are, be we, are not har we are harming the future of our country if we don't practice those. If we avoid being accountable for our actions and instead deflect accountability to other people, to the government, to faceless organizations, we are wrecking the DNA of our country's leadership capability. If we watch injustice and don't take a stand against that, we are in the wrongdoing, we violate the moral and ethical character of our, of our country and of our fellow citizens. If we fail to show our family and our friends, our fellow workers, the traits that the great leaders are recognized for, then we have not honored the intent of our forefathers to create an exceptional union, a free society, a self-government based on religious belief that act as guidance for how Americans are supposed to live. So, each one of us can make a difference in this age of turbulence. That's the challenge I lay before you today. By starting with ourselves, we then can stand for those things that make American citizens great. And then we can demonstrate to others that we have that fiber. It's not just in a book. It's in the way you act. We cannot let the opposite of that happen. I want to leave you with a final thought on leadership in turbulent times. In World War II, our soldiers defeated two empires simultaneously a planet apart. They did it in five years. That's pretty good. Amazing stuff. Then they rebuilt those countries in democracies in the years after that. And we've been at peace with most of those countries since. When you ask our veterans what they fought for, their typical answer was they fought for each other, a team. The War of Wars, a time of unfathomable turbulence, produced thousands of outstanding leaders, iconic generals like Patton, Ike, Bradley, MacArthur, Marshall. And then we also had industry titans, Kaiser, Higgins, Knudsen. And we had some really good politicians that stayed the day and gave, gave America hope and gave them a future in FDR and in Truman. The American women and men of this time became known as the greatest generation. A few years ago, I was with Tom Brokaw. Tom Brokaw uh, was on a tour. I was on a tour with him. And in, during that tour, and you may recall, Tom Brokaw has written the book, The Greatest Generation. Uh, somebody asked him, and they were not kind about asking him. They were argumentative. They said, why do you think that generation is the greatest generation? And they were waiting for an answer that they could debate and, and debate loudly. They wanted to start a fight. And instead, Brokaw looks up, says in that Midwestern twang, every generation has the capacity to be the greatest generation. This is the one I chose based on my feelings. So let's say uh, that leadership shares this very same distinction, doesn't it? It sure does. Every person here today has the capacity to become the greatest leader. We just don't know if it's going to happen or when or why. If you believe in American exceptionalism, the Constitution of the United States, the Bill of Rights, in democracy and liberty, then you are an example of a leader in waiting. Not yet called upon, but there and ready to stand up. If you understand the character required, you do understand the character required to be a patriot, and that's the first step. So the right thing to do an unrelenting ridicule in front of you to stand tall, to let the, 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 the environment you grew up in where you, you were bred to be a better leader, let that work. You share with all Americans this trait, this last trait that really defines what, what that leadership quotient is all about, and that's optimism. Optimism, the absolute conviction that the best days of our country are ahead of us and we're not going to go backwards. That's the nature of our leadership. Our children will own a better life and our society will be a better place to live. This is what we want from our leaders, this is what we should demand. God bless you and God bless America. Thank you. Thank you, Colonel. That was a very inspiring uh, speech, and I'm sure everyone uh, can relate to a lot of those things that you've said. I'd now like to call up Mr. Monty Briggs, commander of EFW Post 7732, uh, for him uh, to present the commemorative wreath.
Good morning, everybody. I'd like to take this opportunity to not only present this wreath to the names that are on this memorial over here, but to all veterans throughout the nation that has given their lives so precious so that we might have this freedom today. So at this time, I would like to invite uh, the members of my post, uh, VFW Post 7732, to come up. And also, I would like to ask the acting mayor to help me to present this read. Thank you. <laughs> 